Good morning. We are here at Cooley Dickinson Hospital with Dr. William Swigard, infectious disease specialist at uh, one of our CDMG practices. He is uh, a bit of an expert in tick-borne diseases and we are going to ask him a few questions. A lot of people are wondering this time of year if, uh, if the ticks are going to start coming out again, when do we start, have to start worrying about them and Dr. Swigard is going to guide us through the history of ticks, Lyme disease, and other wonderful things that we all have to look forward to from ticks um, in the foreseeable future. Good morning, Dr. Swigard. Thanks, Tom. So you ask a wonderful question. Yes, we have entered the springtime as of 10 days ago, and all of us on the East Coast know what a brutal winter it was uh, with some very cold temperatures. Sadly, those cold temperatures don't actually cause the disappearance of Lyme disease. It reduces the activity of the ticks. But here we see 15 years worth of data collected nationwide by the Centers for Disease Control. Lyme disease is a reportable illness. We think that it's somewhat underreported, but there's a legal requirement for laboratories and physicians that make this diagnosis to report the disease. And so the statistics are quite good as these things go. So here we have 291,000 some patients over 15 years. And yes, the warmer months are clearly the peak times of, of disease onset for Lyme disease. However, the bad news is, is that it never really goes away. In uh, January, for example, over those 15 years, some 5,000 people had a disease onset of Lyme disease in the coldest months of the winter. That works out to about 330 of them every year during that period of time, or about 10 cases uh, nationwide every single day during the coldest months of winter. So it's always there and there's... there's Never completely goes away. So yes, we need to be extra careful in the springtime. We need to remind ourselves of the precautions that we need to take. But we also need to be aware that it's possible to get this uh, during the very coldest months. So you've, uh, you've done a lot of research um, on Lyme disease and uh, the history of Lyme disease, and I wonder if you could maybe give us a little sort of recap of, of how we got to where we are today with ticks yeah. and Lyme disease. So, so, how did Lyme disease become connected to ticks? The story actually begins in Old Lyme, Connecticut, which is about 100 miles south of where we are sitting on the Connecticut River, where a young rheumatologist named Alan Steer, he's now a senior rheumatologist, um, came across a geographic cluster of children and adults with a very distinctive type of arthritis involving big, painful, collections of fluid, usually on just one side of the body, usually in a large joint. And working on the basis of the stories, working from the histories, he concluded that this had to be an infectious illness and that the peak occurrence of that illness in the warmer months suggested that it might be transmitted by an arthropod vector. In other words, something that was either an insect or a spider or something on that order. And as you know, ticks are closer to spiders than insects. The next big development in the field happened in Montana as a result of this um, medical entomologist named Willie Bergdorfer, um, who in 1983, so six years after this paper was published, discovered these spirochete, these spiral-shaped bacteria in the digestive system of the deer tick, which we call Ixodes scapularis. And it was not until um, 11 years after that in 1994 that the current standardized test involving antibodies uh, was widely adopted. And I'll have more to say about that later. Can you uh, tell us about the increased incidence of tick-borne disease, including Lyme disease and some other ones that have uh, come on the scene more recently? Um, and 
do you do you, is there any reasoning behind why this is happening uh, is it related to climate change is it related to warming weather any of those things um, it is thought to relate primarily to habitat loss for deer and mice and other forest creatures as our suburbs as our human homes expand further and further from centers of population now here you see a snapshot of nationwide data from 2001 and then another snapshot 15 years later. And it's a little deceptive, okay? There is not a great deal of Lyme disease in South Texas. The dots were placed in the county of the primary residence of the person who had the disease and was reported to the government. So maybe these Texans were vacationing in beautiful New England during the springtime. Uh, in any event, clearly the black areas are getting bigger and blacker, and there are three basic clusters of Lyme disease, one in the northeast, although it is spreading into the southeast, uh, one in the Midwest, particularly the upper Midwest, and that is also spreading southward. Now, if it were global warming, you would expect the opposite, right? The colder regions are getting warmer, so it can't really be about that. And another smaller cluster here in the Pacific Northwest involving a different kind of black leg tick. So that's the geographic distribution. Um, how about the number of cases by year? That's really what you meant by incidence. The incidence rate is the number of new cases per unit of population, usually 100,000 people per year. And that's what we're looking at here. The dark green is cases that were confirmed by blood testing. Beginning in 2008, the CDC started tracking so-called probable cases, cases that were diagnosed with clinical criteria like the Lyme disease rash, this rapidly expanding oval rash that doesn't itch and doesn't hurt and doesn't have to look like a bullseye, but really doesn't look like anything else on earth the provider that sees that rash and knows what he or she is looking at has made that diagnosis, even though the blood test might not be positive. That thing again, that blood test. Anyway, as you see, there has been basically a rise. It looks like uh, for the last 10 years that the number of nationwide cases has settled out at around 35,000 cases per year. There's noise in the data because this is a biological system. Um, we think that, these, that this number of cases would be higher uh, if people were not getting better and better informed about how to protect themselves against ticks because that's really our first line of defense. We don't have safe and effective vaccines against the tick-borne illnesses. Boy, do I wish we did. But until then, self-protection against tick bites is the way to keep you and your family safe. So let's look at this a little more granularly. Let's look at our state, Massachusetts. Here, the darker colors of green indicate the highest incidence rate. The darkest green is greater than 500 cases per 100,000 people per year. And as you can see, the very greenest places are uh, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Cape Cod, particularly Outer Cape, and then basically any place that's green, I mean green in the forested sense, right? For example, there's a great big cluster in the Berkshires. Um, relatively urban Hamden County is less green than Hampshire County, where we are sitting today, roughly where the P is. Um, and Franklin County is greener still and more suburban uh, and forested. So... So what about Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses? Because that was really the original question was, what about these diseases that can be transmitted by ticks, in particular deer ticks? Lyme disease is not the only one, but it is required to be reported, and so our statistics are better for Lyme disease, but there are others. For example, babesiosis caused by a protozoa that infects red cells causes a disease that's something like malaria. There's an anemia, there are high spiking fevers, uh, and a number of other features. Um, 
This, is, this used to be a disease that we only saw he, he, here in Western Massachusetts. We only saw it in people that had vacationed in Cape Cod. And more and more, we are seeing this disease in people that live around here for reasons that are not understood, but are, once again are thought to do with all these new houses we're building. Uh, anaplasmosis is caused by the, uh, an organism with a jaw-dropping name, anaplasma phagocytophilum, phagocyte-loving. What that means is that this bacteria invades neutrophils, the type of white blood cells that fight bacteria. Wait a minute, it invades the blood cells that are supposed to kill it? Yes. This one causes a disease that is either extremely mild or extremely bad with fever and muscle aches and flu-like symptoms and sometimes can be prostrating. Um, new on the scene is an organism related to Borrelia burgdorferi. This one is called Borrelia miyamotoi. Um, newly recognized as a pathogen. It causes Lyme disease, um, but uh, antibodies directed against this new kind of Borrelia do not completely cross-react with this other related Borrelia. And so as a result, the appearance of this disease has brought about big improvements in Lyme testing, and in particular the use of DNA-based tests that look for the organism directly using the techniques of molecular biology. Uh, and then, although there have only been five cases worldwide, there has been a good deal of press um, on Palisand virus, also known as deer tick virus. So this is a num another member of the virus family that includes West Nile virus and also includes Zika virus and chikungunya virus, which I just love to say, and dengue fever and also hepatitis C. Uh, this virus can get into the person's brain. The problem there is that we have no good therapy for this family of viruses, uh, only supportive care. Um, but so far, ultra rare, rare, increasingly common, and actually this one in this area is more common than this one. I'll show you that in the next slide. So here we see, here we see the fall of the Tick Empire. Now, here we see data from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health tracking uh, incidence rates of, uh, sorry, tracking total cases of Lyme disease in green, those are the big bars, anaplasmosis in red, and babesiosis in dark blue. And as you can see, the rate of, of these two minor players is relentlessly increasing, particularly anaplasmosis, but both of them are increasing. And it's not unusual for a person to become infected with more than one of these at once. And uh, that's somebody who's really, really sick, uh, unusually sick. They still are, uh, it's still, if those uh, graphs are, are proportionately visually uh, are. representative, the, it still seems that Lyme disease is dwarfing the other two as as yes. far as the, is how common it is for um, people in Massachusetts anyway. That's true. However, we saw in the neighborhood of a dozen cases last year of people that were sick enough with anaplasmosis to require hospitalization. And a few people, particularly people that had, either didn't have a spleen or who were immunosuppressed for other reasons, with very severe babesiosis requiring hospitalization. So that kind of illness is definitely on the rise. Uh, what are the best ways to sort of protect yourself uh, from tick-borne disease? You say there's not really reliable um, vaccines, and I'm not sure if that's just because these are primarily bacteria as opposed to viruses, or is that... Uh... You can vaccinate against bacteria. The problem is, at least in human trials, the very first uh, Lyme vaccine was a failure. Uh, it included a single protein from the outer coat of that corkscrew-shaped bacteria. And actually, the outer coat changes rapidly. It's a very crafty bacteria. But the reason that that vaccine was withdrawn from the market was that even though it consisted of only one protein from this complex organism, 
people were coming down with a chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia-like illness that resembled this thing called post-Lyme syndrome that can affect something like 10 to 15% of people with real live Lyme disease who then suffer a protracted illness with exhaustion and brain fog and uh, pain all over their bodies. Uh, they were getting that from a vaccine that only involved one protein. And so that vaccine was yanked and we have no vaccines for the other entities that I just talked about. So that leaves us with self-protection against tick bites. And I realize there's a lot of text here. Those of you on smaller screens may not be able to see it, but hopefully you can see the general principles here. You want to avoid direct contact with ticks by staying out of the environments that are the most risky. So deer ticks don't drop down on you from the trees. They have climbed out to the outer leaves of either uh, low plants like grasses, if you're a deer tick nymph and you're trying to get the blood of a mouse, or sort of knee-sized shrubs if you're an adult deer tick and you're trying to get the blood of a passing deer. And they, and they hang out at the end of these leaves with their little arms extended. It's called questing. And if something brushes into them, they grab on tight, find a vein uh, by smell, and plunge this creepy looking harpoon-like mouth thing into that blood vessel. So we say avoid areas with high grass and leaf debris if you're on a trail, please walk in the center of the trail. Uh, secondly, you want to repel ticks on your skin and on your clothing. And the recommendation is to use a repellent uh, that doesn't just repel insects, but also repels ticks. Remember, ticks are um, arachnids. They are more closely related to spiders than to insects. And so uh, it's important that it be a chemical that repels them. Generally speaking, these repellents work by masking the odor of our exhaled carbon dioxide. So DEET is a traditional prep, probably the best studied uh, repellent ever. But for people who are allergic to DEET or are concerned about the fact that DEET can sometimes cause skin irritation, um, it can dissolve plastic, it's an organic compound, there are alternatives like picaridin, IR3535, and oil of lemon eucalyptus that are almost as effective as DEET. Um, you should think of these like sunscreen. If you go in swimming or otherwise get wet, you should reapply. Uh, but unless that happens, these are usually good for several hours. If you have children, then it should be the grown-ups that apply these preps to the children, avoiding their hands, their eyes, and their mouths. You can also use a compound called permethrin on your clothing and on your gear, but not on your skin. Permethrin is actually an acaricide. It's a chemical that kills spiders and ticks. Um, Pre-treated clothing impregnated with permethrin is available. That may last a little longer than doing this yourself. There are instructions on some websites I'm going to show you later about how to put it on your clothes. After it's been applied and properly dried, it can last through several washings. Um, I've heard uh, actually permethrin uh, can be very harmful to cats too. Is that true? That uh... It's generally when one is actually applying the liquid, which can be toxic to any mammal. Uh, it has to be done outdoors in a well-ventilated place. You're supposed to hang the garments until dry on a clothesline or something like that. Uh, the dried compound, much less hazardous than the liquid compound. So once you've finished enjoying the beautiful outdoors, uh, you should shower or bathe within two hours of coming inside and check your entire body with a mirror, either a hand mirror or a full-length mirror, um, for ticks. And if you have children, you need to check very carefully under their arms, in and around their ears, in the belly button, behind the knees, between the legs, around the waist, and very special attention to scalp and hair. You want to look at the gear. You want to look at your pets because people can get the, people who never go outdoors can get this from their pets. Uh, you want to tumble dry the clothes you wore on high heat for a minimum of 10 minutes, and if those clothes are soiled, you need to wash them in hot water. Um, and what do you do if you get nailed anyway?
So most cases of Lyme disease are transmitted by tick bites that the uh, patient never detected while they were being bitten, and that's because the tick actually injects you with a local anesthetic so that you don't feel the bite, and an anticoagulant so that your blood doesn't clot while it's feasting on you. Yuck! Um, to remove a tick from your skin, you want to use fine tip tweezers. You want to grasp the tick very close to the skin with those tweezers and pull straight up with steady pressure. Um, you should dispose of a tick either by plunging it into rubbing alcohol or putting it in something like a sealed pill box uh, or flushing it down the toilet. And you want to clean the bite area and your hands with soap and water. Things that don't work include painting the tick with nail polish, painting the tick with Vaseline, uh, using the end of a blown out but recently lit match to make the tick detach. None of these actually work. And you really shouldn't crush a tick with your fingers because if you have any little cuts um, on those fingers, you can actually get the disease that way. So this is a big topic. And the internet is full of information, not all of it particularly reliable. For people that still have questions, there is, thank you, Christina Trincaro. There is a wealth of information uh, at the Centers for Disease Control website at cdc.gov slash ticks, and also the Department of Public Health of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts mass.gov slash tick dash born dash diseases. Uh, additional information at the New York State uh, website. Dr. Swigard, uh, thanks for being here. We have one more question for you. Uh, just looking down down the, uh, the highway here um, and seeing how in general it seems like either we're, we're our incursion into wilderness areas are whatever it is that's causing the, the, the general upswing in these tick-borne diseases, have there been any medical advances uh, in treatment or prevention that, are, that go a little beyond maybe tucking your pants into your socks and spraying yourself with uh, DEET? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, to me, as someone that makes this diagnosis on a regular basis, there is a crying need to improve the current testing. Uh, the current method of testing people based on antibodies to the organism can sometimes delay that diagnosis by two to four weeks and maybe longer. What is critically needed is a method of diagnosing this illness in the doctor's office or in the emergency room, either right away or within 24 hours. So rapid tests for tick-borne illnesses uh, would be a boon. So we already have rapid tests for anaplasma and Babesia, but traditionally there's been a problem with using this DNA-based testing, which uses a technique called PCR, or the preliminaries chain reaction. That's a way of amplifying a particular stretch of DNA. Um, those tests worked well for uh, biological fluids like cerebrospinal fluid in a spinal tap or synovial fluid if you're tapping one of those big swollen joints. But the PCR for Lyme disease did not work reliably in blood or in plasma or in serum, and it was thought that there was some sort of inhibitory substance in that. The arrival of Borrelia miyamotoi has begun to change that, and we are excited to see the development of PCR assays that actually work on blood that are capable of distinguishing the closely related but non-identical species B. Miyamotoi and B. Burgdorferi. So I think that's this year's uh, big development. Um, we're always looking for better ways to treat things. The good news about Lyme disease is that like its first cousin syphilis, uh, antibiotic resistance in Lyme disease has not been described. And we can still use relatively simple antibiotics penicillins, cephalosporins, tetracyclines to effectively treat most, but not all, of the tick-borne illnesses. Thank you very much, Dr. Swigard. Uh, once again, uh, Dr. William Swigard from Cooley Dickinson Medical Group Infectious Diseases. Uh, thanks again for being here, everyone. Be careful out there. Uh, 
and have a great time in the woods. Uh, 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 just protect yourselves, and uh, we'll see you next time on Cooley Dickinson Facebook Live. Thanks.